Yeah. Hello and welcome everyone. We'll get started here in just a moment. Just want to give uh, people a chance to get their audio settled in in case they haven't. Uh, this seems like a good critical mass. I'm sure people will come after this, so I'll make sure it's all in the chat as well. But thanks for uh, coming to today's webinar. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few technical details. Um, in case you haven't done a Zoom webinar before, it's obviously very similar to Zoom meeting with a couple key differences. Uh, the most obvious is that your cameras and microphones are disabled by default, so you don't have to worry about interrupting us but it does mean if you want to ask a question or interact with each other, you've got some different options available to you. Uh, first is the most obvious chat option. The main difference between that in Zoom meeting versus Zoom webinar is that you'll need to select everyone from the drop-down menu. Uh, otherwise, only the hosts and panelists will see whatever you've written. Um, and then if you have a question for the panel, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function. You can ask those questions anonymously uh, you can upload existing questions and you can add your own comments to those as well. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for us to manage the Q&A. Um, if you have a question that really requires you to speak, you can use the hand raise function. I'll just come and make sure you want to be able to speak and we can unmute you at that time. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to uh, William Rose to kick things off. Well, great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Will Rose. I am the Chief Technology Officer at StudentSelect.ai. Uh, we're a provider of AI-powered AI solutions and advanced analytics for higher ed, specifically in the admissions space. Uh, we're proud to sponsor today's webinar, which will cover some important items regarding AI technology for admissions leaders, which is becoming more mainstream in higher ed. Uh, I'll be moderating the Q&A area in the Zoom uh, webinar, so please feel free to enter any questions uh, you have throughout the presentation, and we'll be sure to cover them during the Q&A portion of the webinar, which will come towards the end of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Emily D. Campion. Dr. Campion is an assistant professor in management in the Strong College of Business at Old Dominion University. She is also a consultant for Campion Services. Her research falls under the Future of Work umbrella and includes topics related to machine learning and natural language processing and personnel selection, alternative and remote work experiences, and workforce diversity. Uh, Emily, thank you, and I'll now hand things over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Will. I'm excited to be here talking today about demystifying AI for uh, university admissions leaders. It seems we can't go anywhere without thinking about artificial intelligence from uh, our phones and predictive text to using AI to uh, detect diseases you know, more quickly. Um, and for all the advantages that it can bring, uh, there are still many challenges, a lot of barriers associated with artificial intelligence that we'll talk about today. Um, and so individuals and institutions alike need to be smart consumers. Uh, anyone who's paying attention to the AI landscape would be able to observe that it is a lot like the Wild West. There are not very many regulations at this time, particularly at the federal level. Most are occurring uh, state by state. The one you may be most familiar with is the Video Interview Act in Illinois, uh, which I was looking up. Uh, I was looking at this website that we can send out that, that tracks this, and I saw that they recently amended certain parts of it regarding reporting uh, demographic variables. So something to keep an eye on. Um, and while higher education has been pivotal in the development of artificial intelligence, in fact, it earned its name, artificial intelligence, from an academic conference many years ago, many decades ago. Um, much like the federal government, higher education moves slowly like a big ship, but inevitably artificial intelligence has made its way into higher education, not simply uh, being being taught necessarily, it's, it's been there for a while, but in terms of, of being um, you know, part of the decision-making process because higher, higher education has traditionally been quite conservative with those things. But we, we believe it's sort of happening at this time due to shortages in the admissions process. So those shortages 
come in three flavors, although I uh, suspect there are, of course, many admissions folks in the room who would say there are a few more. These are sort of the broad three we've identified. Uh, first are tighter budgets, and we had tight budgets before COVID. As a faculty member, I'm well aware of, of, of some of those budget cuts that occurred during COVID, which has made it even tougher. Uh, and, and budget cuts often mean fewer staff, uh, and fewer staff means less time with candidates uh, or applicants. Um, and we've also seen um, admissions uh, officers use or have access to less information on candidates. Now, this has happened in a couple of ways. The, the main one has happened in service of improving representation on campus and improving access to education. Uh, something that we've noticed during, during COVID is access to standardized testing became extremely difficult. And so higher education uh, institutions had to make some really tough decisions about how to assess applicants without standardized testing. And so we're seeing this reduced reliance on standardized testing. And while again, that's in service of a very noble goal for higher education, it also leaves admissions with some with less information to work with, uh, which, which of course is a ma massive challenge due to this important decision. So let's define our, um, so we believe that artificial intelligence can really help with this, um, uh, particularly with leveraging resources more effectively, particularly if you have you don't have very many, and then helping to make uh, better decisions. So the, the the goal of today is to to speak about how it can it can be helpful, but also speak about its challenges. As an academic, I think it's my job to also ensure to say this this part of that research is not well developed yet. So be cautious. Um, so let's define AI. Uh, unfortunately, the definition is very, very broad for those of you who may be more familiar with it than others. It's simply about the imitation of human behavior by computers. And, and it's at this point I like to remind individuals whether or not I'm speaking to a crowd like this or speaking with students that we often, when we think about AI, we think about human replacement. And that's fair because that's the way it's been spoken about in popular press. Um, and we've seen that ourselves with technology replacing humans. It's happened since the very first industrial revolution. Now we are on our fourth. Um, it's characterized by a number of things, uh, but particularly intelligent uh, systems such as AI. But in the case of admissions and hiring, now most of my research in this area is in employment, not higher, higher education, but admissions is, a, is an analogous context, I believe. So we can, we can maybe draw some generalizability from those five Findings. But, but it's not to replace human decision making for several reasons. First, we need more research to be able to do that. And second, we're making decisions on humans. And when we make important high stakes decisions on humans, whether or not that's through employment or whether it's through admitting to a, a university, humans are, are very sensitive to justice in those instances. So it's, it's really important we see AI as an aid or a tool for human decision makers, not a replacement. So that's that's our our, um, our baseline for this presentation. AI is really helpful in in really two key ways. So the first is it's really helpful when tasks are repetitive, frequently performed, and time consuming. So let's look at a higher ed exam education example. So it seems to me that higher education, many many institutions have done a lot of work to generate content for not only their current students, but potential students. And I can imagine the admission staff uh, uh, experience a lot of the same questions over and over again around things like, where do I actually submit my application? What materials do I need? But of course, you guys have already done the work of putting that online somewhere. So we can envision chatbots being used to help uh, applicants navigate toward that information without taking the time of a staffer who's trying to do many, many other things and probably wears way too many hats. And so we can, we can envision chatbots being helpful there and guiding toward the right material for students. At the same time, uh, in addition to admissions putting this material and this content online, I know that programs put material online for potential students like vignettes or experiences by, by alums. And so they can navigate through this information using a chatbot to guide them to gauge their fit with a program or use that to find their way to instances where they can speak with a mentor instead of uh, you know, burdening trying to navigate through people who are really busy. And so using natural language processing to develop these models can be incredibly helpful. And then of course, once they become students, we are seeing uh, chatbots being used more so in career services and student affairs to help workers there as well. 
The second way that AI can be helpful. So remember, the first is about you know repetitive, uh, time-consuming tasks. This one is about being able to synthesize large amounts of information from diverse sources. Now, our 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 brains are incredible. They they just they are, but we are not great at doing this repeatedly. Uh, we often have our own biases that come in. Uh, we run out of cognitive resources, put differently, we get tired. And so these sorts of things can affect how we synthesize information. So if we leave it to an algorithm that we, we train well, it, it does the same thing every single time. And it's really good at this. This is what they're built for. So let's look at a higher ed example. So you can imagine you've got you know, thousands of applicants with lots of material and they do such a great job submitting all of this material and generating it and you want to see all of it, I'm sure. What we can do is use AI to actually extract information from student materials and then train a model to create composites. And then from those composites, we can create you know, three tiers, for example. Uh, the first tier are students that we know are gonna be admitted. We, with the, you know, we know students who have their, their characteristics, their grades generally do well. And so we can move them through the process and we don't have to spend more resources trying to evaluate them. We know from our, our research using AI that they're gonna do fine or they're predicted to do fine. Um, but then we can spend more time, particularly on tier two, uh, giving them re additional resources or spending time trying to figure out what they're, whether or not they fit with the uh, institution or the program they're interested in. And finally, this offers a quicker feedback loop. So instead of you know, going home with stacks, either physical stacks or digital stacks of materials from students and, and this being you know, a multi-week, multi-month process, we feed the algorithm, it offers this information back quite quickly, which, I mean, we all remember, you know, trying to get into college and, and that experience being so nerve wracking. So having that information come to us more quickly as, as applicants as well is, uh, is, is certainly a benefit. Now, something we are seeing tied to this notion that we have less information we're making these decisions on now uh, than, than before, something we're seeing is schools being interested in social media scraping, is understanding maybe features of our students by scraping their social media, whether or not you see some examples here, um, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any, any other type. Um, the data on this, the, the findings on this are really mixed. Most of the ones I'm familiar with are out of hiring, and we really have two camps in our science and my science about whether or not these should be used in the analogous context of employment. Um, the first side says we do see that this predicts beyond the hiring decision. It does have information that's useful to their behavior at work. And then the other side says, listen, this is an impression managed version of a candidate they're not bringing that, that, those characteristics to the workplace or to the classroom. And so quite frankly, the research is, is a bit mixed as of yet. This is one of those areas you'll recall at the very beginning, I said there's some places where we need more research in order to make decisions as to whether or not to operationalize. And this is one of those instances. Another way that um, we can use artificial intelligence to synthesize a lot of information is using it through automatically scored uh, video interviews. Now, video interviews uh, offer uh, a lot of flexibility to staffers who are making admissions decisions or hiring decisions because students can complete these at their leisure and uh, admissions can look at it at their leisure, which offers a type of flexibility that planned interviews just simply don't. The, the, the research in this, again, is mostly out of hiring. Those who do it well are doing it using the, 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 the long history of structured interviewing out of employment. Uh, there's also a little bit of research that have, has looked at facial analysis, and uh, the, the evidence is a little mixed there as well. Uh, some of the companies who have done that have actually put that to rest because of uh, uh, public opinion that it was concerning, which of course is something we have to think about when we when we use artificial intelligence. So this is a really robust area and one place that I think we will absolutely see higher education using this if they don't already, uh, not the facial analysis, but the other features we can extract from the language they actually use. So pulling content of their interview uh, responses. So I've touched already on a couple things that make AI promising, but let's let's try to tie them to those sh those resource shortages. So first we said there, you know, there's tighter budgets and that's fewer staff. Fewer staff means less time with students already. We've talked about a couple examples where we can alleviate the admissions officers 
um, from spending so much time sort of trying to evaluate these materials by using an algorithm to help them do that, enabling them to have more meaningful face time with applicants, um, uh, which is the really the part that matters so much in admissions is, is speaking with students. I know that's something you enjoy or else you wouldn't be doing admissions. Now, the second, uh, the third shortage, but the second one here is limited information. So again, we're working with less information and it's not just because we're working with uh, uh, reduced reliance on standardized testing, but also because students provide such, uh, such an incredible amount of text data in their submissions, but historically text data have been so, so difficult to score. You've got thousands of applicants who are submitting uh, personal statements, responses to essay questions, or maybe interview questions, resumes, letters of recommendation, um, uh, transcripts, you've got all of this that that processing as a human and processing thousands of these as a human is such a cumbersome task. Um, and so if we can offload some of that and use natural language processing to extract information, this really offers us an opportunity to then combine these with the data that are already quantified, such as GPA or other scores they may have to create those composites I was mentioning before. But really importantly, we think uh, coming out of, of this these data are, are characteristics that aren't currently being assessed in an admissions um, system. So personality variables related to student outcomes, for example, may be missed. Again, we ask students for a lot of things, but there's there's a point at which we can't ask for much more. So we can actually use information they already give us and use natural language processing, which is a type of artificial intelligence to extract information um, and inform our decision making. Let's talk about these other characteristics for a moment. I'm going to stick with personality, mostly because uh, I think a lot of people understand broadly, you know, what personality is, and also it has a really long and rich his history, not only in employment but also in admissions. So, personality research helps us understand how people are going to perform on the job or in the classroom. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, five-factor model, also known as the Big Five. Maybe some of you were taught that it's uh, the acronyms Ocean or Canoe. So of those five variables, which are sort of the five main personality variables we, we tend to study, uh, conscientiousness is the most consistent predictor across, across environments. It, the individuals who are high on conscientiousness are, are organized, they're planful, and they're achievement oriented. And we can imagine uh, it, that, of course, highly conscientious students are, are much more successful in undergraduate programs. Uh, myself, I was in the classroom yesterday, I taught two classes, and I was thinking about this and thought, yeah, I mean, my most conscientious students are the ones who tend to do better in my course. Um, what, what AI can also offer, and I think that this, again, is as I'm sort of speaking from a faculty member perspective at this point, uh, crossing over that, that research or the faculty member uh, or teacher uh, role, uh, something that we struggle with so much with students is are the red flags now now what we can we can do is use artificial intelligence to extract again to extract this information but we can then do analyses to see what are some of the red flags we can identify early with with students either um, in the application process so we can ask them during the interview maybe gaps in their history or concerning responses and even more so how can we identify barriers early on so how, what are the types of characteristics that are predicting things like likely to drop out or likely to go on academic probation again being being a faculty member being a teacher I I don't I see them when they're juniors and seniors sometimes I get them when they're with their sophomores for some of them I'm the first sort of 35 person class 35 person class they have. And so that's the first time that maybe a faculty member actually notices, hey, you're struggling. Let's talk about what resources are available on campus. Because uh, I mean, campuses spend so much time and money developing these resources and students absolutely use them. But there are students who really need them that don't know about them. And so if we can identify those things early, we can get there earlier and intervene and offer these resources right off the bat. Now, we cannot force students to to use these resources, even though sometimes we really want to, because we know they'll be more successful. Um, but we can at least offer these things and introduce them to it early, as opposed to waiting until, you know, their junior or senior year when they finally have small classes and some of those barriers are realized by faculty. So in addition to the, you know, personality, 
uh, and things that predict student success. We can also examine characteristics required of the occupation. So we can look even further ahead than where the students are and say, what are some things that this student has that we know will predict uh, their success in their chosen occupation. This is said understanding that students change majors. And so it may be the case that there are, uh, it actually it is the case, there are universal characteristics that do predict in each occupation. But for those who maybe are going to graduate school, this is a really important feature. Let's, let's take nursing, for example. So nurses, we of course want them to be conscientious, but in addition, we'd also like them to be decisive, have good bedside manner, which, you know, those social skills. Uh, we want them to be service oriented and rule-based. And so these are the sorts of things we can extract from that text data and actually use to try and predict um, uh, additional outcomes down the line, such as their success in the occupation. Speaking of alternative outcomes, those, what we just talked about were things from the, uh, from the, applicant side that we could draw from their materials they've submitted. Of course, we can also look at alternative outcomes, so the other end of the model. We can look at performance metrics on campus, so in the classroom, how are they actually performing and train our data to that instead of the hiring decision. We'll talk more about the implications for that in a moment. Um, we can talk about program completion. There's not a single university I'm aware of that doesn't think a lot about retention. It's a massive problem. It was a massive problem, of course, before COVID. It's a massive problem now. Uh, and then licensure exams down the line, this might be more relevant for graduate schools. Uh, but, but again, can we predict what features predict whether or not they will actually pass their licensing exams? And then finally, sort of in our minds, the gold standard for, for especially for graduate programs, although potentially undergraduate as well, is performance on the job post-graduation. Um, uh, and the reason I say more so for graduates, again, is because we understand that, that uh, the average student does tend to change their major maybe a couple times uh, uh, before they do graduate. So train it to, so modeling that might be a little bit trickier, but certainly for, for a graduate program, this would be useful. Now, we'll kindly mention that one of my research areas is wor workplace diversity. And that, that really takes a couple of forms, though most relevant here is my research on adverse impact reduction. So I, again, mostly do that on, in employment, but but my, my, probably my favorite area of research is finding these sorts of ways that we can, we can reduce adverse impact in employment selections or admission selections. And in my opinion, no conversation on AI is complete without talking about bias. Um, so let's dig in a little bit and see what some of those, those areas are, where some of those uh, complexities lie. So data, uh, excuse me, bias in, in artificial intelligence tends to occur from two sources. First, the data that the model is being trained to. So what, is, what does that mean exactly? So when we train a model, we're training a model to a decision so that it can replicate that decision down the line without human uh, without humans actually doing any scoring. So you build the model by doing an extreme amount of scoring. I think it's the next maybe two slides where we talk about that a bit more, but we train the model to a human decision and then we, we feed the algorithm data and then it tells us what that decision would be based on the model that was developed. So if you're, if you're building a model, if you're training your model to historic decisions and those historic decisions show subgroup differences, you're going to perpetuate those subgroup differences. I'm sure that many of us can think of examples, probably from the news where we've heard about artificial intelligence being a, a model being trained to a human decision and it, um, you know, it's disadvantaging women, for example. We've seen this happen. And that's because you're, you're training to a biased data set. So of course you're gonna have bias, but, but this is all part of the learning process with understanding artificial intelligence. Now, um, a good example most recently is Brookings uh, just did a, had a recent article on using AI to determine financial aid amounts. Now, I think in sort of theory, this sounds like a good idea. That's a, that's a tough decision. That's a big decision that comes with a lot of data that need to be processed so that they can make that decision. However, if you've been paying attention to artificial intelligence research over the last 10 years or its applications, you would remember that there were, you know, several years ago, banks that were trying to use artificial intelligence to make lending decisions on loans, and they trained it to his historic decisions, and historic decisions had bias, and so they found evidence of lending discrimination. 
Um, now, most of you at this point might be thinking, why would I use this if it has this potential issue? Well, fortunately, um, areas of research such as interviewing or psychometrics out of psychology help us understand why that's happening and offer us um, opportunities to reduce it. And so here's one way that we've done it. My, I personally have done this uh, uh, out of my consulting and also in research where we're using, we're having multiple human raters per candidate, not just one person saying, giving, making a decision. It's, it's three or more human raters making, uh, giving ratings on candidate materials using systematic, uh, you know, systematically scoring with anchored scales. So what does, what does that mean? That means instead of one person saying, you know, at one to five, how do you rate this candidate? And one is, you know, probably won't succeed and five is definitely will succeed. I mean, my definition of that might be very different from Will's, for example. So that's not offering us much reliability, which is very important because we're trying to model this over and over again, and we need it to be reliable. Instead, you're going to use behaviorally anchored rating scales. So does so a five out of five on on leadership would be this person communicate uh, you know offered evidence they communicated with their team for example in an interview question this person um, motivated offered ways to motivate their team this person communicated the outcome of their you know leader behaviors that would be a five and so you can see how that's very different from having one out of five you know five is they'll probably succeed in this program and then finally of course reliability nothing as very few things matter in psychometrics more than reliability and so again really using the research we have in other areas that has shown for decades that this sort of structuring of uh, of scoring absolutely helps reduce bias. The other way we can help in this way is um, by monitoring. And this seems so silly and it probably might even maybe ob too obvious to say, of course, we're gonna, we're gonna monitor this, but we monitor it in the same way we monitor human systems, right? So if you look at uh, admissions uh, you know, systems, I'm sure that you guys are monitored in the sense that you guys are checked in on and you are insured and you look at actually the distribution of individuals who are being admitted and you constantly check and reiterate. And so it's the same thing that we do with systems that are purely built from humans. We do that with AI. It requires updating as well because the world evolves and we need to update, particularly when it comes to language use. The other way that we see bias enter our models is, so the first way was how we're training. Are we training it to bias data? Then we're, we're gonna get an, out, an output that we don't even need to think about. We shouldn't even look at. The other way is through applicant data. So it may be that applicants explicitly mention their race, gender, age, or other type of protected class. Of course, that's, that can introduce bias into the model. The other way that sort of eludes people sometimes are proxies. So because the United States is still geographically segregated in many ways, zip code acts as a proxy, for example, for race. And that's something that needs to be considered. I'll tell you more about the internship one in a second. That one was really interesting. But these proxies can, be, uh, can, can hide from us. We don't realize that they're really happening. But once we see them, we say, oh, wow, yeah, of course, that's a, that's a proxy for race or gender or age, and we should be really cautious. We reduce this by ensuring, first of all, just ensuring those explicit mentions aren't there in the data, we just take those out. And then we conduct analyses. We look through and we say, are any of our variables, anything that we're drawing from the data showing subgroup differences? And what do those mean? And, and, and again, conducting those analyses to ensure that those aren't biasing, biasing our results in a way that disadvantage, disadvantages protected groups. Now there are, there's a lot of there are many organizations that care about this, many researchers who care about this, and lots of ongoing research to try and understand how bias occurs in our AI models. And this, I'll give you this one example because I thought it was interesting. This one organization uh, did some analyses and found that internship was a proxy for age, because if you can imagine a 23 year old when they're you know applying for a job and they're answering interview questions what do they what professional experience do they have likely not very much if, if they go sort of the traditional route um, where they go straight from high school to to college they probably don't have a lot of professional experience but they have internships and so they speak about their internships meanwhile someone in their 40s why would they speak about their internships from when they were 22 when they have you know 15 or 16 20 years of of um of professional experience to to speak 
from. So you can see how some of these proxies hide, uh, but they require us to do additional analyses. And once we do those, we can do a much better job of cleaning our data to reduce, uh, reduce the likelihood that we're biasing our models. So my takeaways for you guys are first, AI requires monitoring it like any other system. Now, it takes a little time to build. It does save time and, and money in the long run, but, but it requires monitoring just like, just like humans. Um, and we do have some early and compelling research that AI can actually be a really useful tool for admissions officers. And we'll move on to Q&A. Thank you. Great, so uh, Emily, we have a, a couple of questions that have come in, so we'll uh, jump right into those. Wonderful. So uh, so this is a good question. Uh, you, you know, you touched on, on uh, on some of this when you had the nursing example for some of the traits that you know we might find helpful but um what are some of the uh, other personality traits uh, that seem to be good predictors of success mm, that's a good one uh student success we can envision things like adaptability we can envision things like grit uh to be strong predictors now admittedly um i'm not speaking directly from <clears throat> excuse me research on um, uh, in the admissions space. I'm speaking more from the hiring space. Uh, I hope that's all right. But I do, I do believe it's analogous here. And so uh, I would say, you know, conscientiousness, of course, that achievement orientation, which we can measure in a couple different ways. Um, uh, and then uh, adaptability. Uh, and then things around uh, like critical thinking skills would be some of the big ones, particularly in healthcare, uh, to play off the nursing example. But I can, if anyone, I should mention this, if anyone is interested in additional resources, I can certainly provide those. Great. Uh, you know, kind of along the same lines, you, you, meant, you talked a little bit about um, uh, red flags. Um, so one of the other questions that we had are, are there any personality traits that might be uh, considered red flags? Yeah, so so we have in personality, we have uh, we've got the big five that I mentioned. We also have something called the dark triad, though, which is, you know, narcissism, psychopathy and Machiavellianism. They sound very threatening. Um, these are not these. We're not talking about uh, like the narcissistic disorder. We're talking about personality traits. And and some of those have been shown to be uh, offer, you know, counterproductive behaviors or predict counterproductive behaviors in in the workplace. And I think, you know, that's absolutely um, uh, something we could use to predict in, in class as well. Uh, you know, if there's el elements of too, too much narcissism then, or uh, actually too little, I'll get to that in a moment, too much narcissism, we see students aren't going to be successful in groups. And guess what college is? 90% group work. However, there's some really fascinating research, I'd be happy to send this to you, on um, how moderate amounts of narcissism actually do predict leader effectiveness. And we always like to talk about Steve Jobs as the example, but I'm sure that you can sort of see this either if you talk you know, your interactions with students directly or, um, or if you're in the classroom, you can absolutely see how a student who's maybe, you know, uh, mildly attention seeking uh, uh, and, and some of the other parts of narcissism, that's not, the, that's not a variable I study often, but I do know some of that research, that they actually emerge as the leaders in their groups and that they can really rally people sometimes. So, so offering um, um, that sort of a positive spin on narcissism. Another one that we see predict uh, things like counterproductivity, absenteeism, withdrawal are things like negative affectivity, which is just a fancy fun way of saying bad attitude. We can measure that and it does tend to predict uh, oddly. So we're not talking about, hey, this student had a crummy day. We're saying, you know, on average, they have, you know, they are, they have a negative affective trait. So over time, they tend to spin things negatively, think of things negatively. This tends to reduce their self-efficacy or their ability to really respond to challenges. And therefore we would likely see that they would not be as successful, but that's, I think a really good example of one where offering opportunities early to build self-efficacy, which is of course, you know, the ability that your belief that you can handle the challenges that come at you, if we can offer some of those things early before, you know, before they come to campus or when they're early on campus and introduce them into clubs to find them social support, that would be an example where we can, we can see it, we can identify it, and then we can offer resources to them. Great. Um, 
Another question. Um, is there a way to find out if our human decisions in the past were biased? So it is something you touched on uh, a little bit as well. Yeah. And so if, if, for example, you're looking at, you, you have data on human decisions historically, you can absolutely do analyses to see, um, you know, if you, if you didn't, if, if those decisions were biased. Now, uh, when I say biased, I think I'm speaking quite broadly, but I'm more narrowly, if, if you and I were sitting, you know, on a Zoom call together and talking about what you were interested in looking at, it would be, what subgroup differences are you seeing and how do those how are, you know, maybe how are those occurring? So do you see that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're admitting more men or more women or non-binary or, you know, into a, into a certain uh, program or admitting them generally more or less often, of course, by ratio ethnicity as well, you can do these subgroup differences simply to see if there is an even distribution, um, uh, which because the United States is, is not evenly distributed by race or gender, it would be an argument of using adverse impact. And I'm gonna get a little bit technical here. There is a formula for that. It's quite simple. Um, and I'd be happy to send more information on that. The, the straightforward, I went very professorial there. The straightforward answer is yes, you can do analyses to see if you, you do, do have subgroup differences in your historic decisions. Great. Um, uh, so this next question actually is something that uh, I can answer. Great. If we, uh, if we use the common app, can we still analyze our data with AI? Um, the answer to that is absolutely. So, um, you know, and that's something that Student Select uh, helps uh, schools with uh, is we can uh, take that data from within the common app and, you know, perform our uh, you know, analysis on that um, through, you know, uh, AI methods to, uh, to kind of standard data science practices um, and, you know, build these models around that. Uh, so absolutely. The short, short answer is uh, yes, we, we can certainly do that. The schools can certainly do that. And uh, that's something that, that we can help with as well. Um, if I may pop in, I, I, I don't think I drove that point home enough yet. That, so thank you so much for asking that. And thank you, Will. I, um, what's really great about AI and why I love studying natural language processing is we're just, we're studying text we already have, which is just so fantastic, which means we don't have to generate new stuff. And as admissions officers, I'm sure you're very well aware that actually changing the process is difficult, but also gathering new stuff takes time and deciding what to gather. And as a researcher, data collection is exhausting. And so if we can use our archival data, all the better. And that's a, a real big value of using AI is we can, we can use data we already have. This, uh, this next question is actually uh, a pretty important one. Uh, what worries you about, uh, what worries you about uh, using AI in admissions? Uh, anything specifically, Emily? Yeah, I, so I, I love this question. I, I, I love talking to people about this topic because admittedly there are things that, even though I study this, there are things I don't know, but I, I do know how to figure out the answers. So if, um, if we want to understand, for example, take that subgroup example, someone was asking, can we look at our historic data? We can run analyses on the, on the, on the sub, uh, submission materials, and we can actually pretty much pinpoint where that bias was coming from. Remember the proxy example. So we may be able to figure out if there are patterns in the data where people are consistently being rejected for a certain reason. Um, and that reason will emerge in the data somewhere probably. And so I, I when, when using this area, it's an area I know this doesn't worry me that the, there are two things that worry me at the outset. First, replacing human decisions. I. I think the reaction of students and the reaction of applicants to this um, can't be understated and needs to be researched more. There's not a ton of research on it um, because not a lot of people do it. So finding, you know, collecting good data is hard. So thinking that this is a replacement for humans at this stage in the, in the research um, is I think concerning. And I hope everyone walks away thinking to themselves, AI is a tool for me to use. It's not, you know, this is supposed to aid in my decision-making. It's not supposed to replace me. And the second thing is I really worry about ones that I don't understand how to do. So things like facial analysis, I don't understand how to do it. So that one I'd rather we don't use on students. Um, so th those are the things that bug me, but but I think the I think the popular rhetoric around facial analysis has pretty much died down um, because there've been such in, 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 uh, important reactions to it. So th those are the ones that concern me. The second one doesn't really concern me because I don't think that's coming into uh, to higher education anytime soon, but but thinking we can replace humans with this right now is uh, premature. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that students select, uh, completely agrees with. And, you know, uh, at least from our perspective, it's not about automating your admissions process, right? It's just about providing you with more data and more tools to be able to um, streamline, to make things more efficient um, and to, you know, incrementally uh, help the process. So I, I think that that was a great question um, and a great answer, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, this next question is, is another one that uh, I can answer myself. Uh, so does it take a long time to get this analysis done on mm -hmm. our applicants? Um, so it, so that's a little bit of a tricky question. It really depends on what kind of resources you have available to you. If it's something you want to do uh, in-house, uh, you'd, you know, you'd probably need a, a team that can do a data analysis and, you know, be able to extract that and build models, uh, you know, in respect working with an organization like ours, a student select, um, that's, you know, it's a pretty quick process. I mean, this isn't a, a long-term, you know, science project, right? It's, it's really, uh, we have a team that um, knows how to approach uh, this model building, understanding the data. Um, so, you know, the initial stages of understanding the data and building a model, we're talking, you know, days, we're not talking weeks or months. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of understand historically what uh, you know has you know the the data from the Common App uh, information, we understand that we build the models around it, and then processing you know new applicants moving forward is a very quick um, uh, process. You'll be able to get those advanced analytics and the scoring uh, and those recommendations um, relatively quickly. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I'll, I'll amend as well if that's our, not amend, I'll add. Uh, well, yeah, the, some of these initial analyses, they don't, they don't take very long, you know, a few days, like he said, if your model is built a few weeks, maybe just to ensure, but that's sort of me hedging as a researcher. And it's going to take me a couple of days and it takes me a couple of weeks. But um, if you're building a model fresh and you need to strengthen your criterion, so if you need to rescore your data because you find that historic decisions do show subgroup differences, that can take a little bit longer. But again, you're using this model over and over again. Um, and, and so this isn't necessarily a one-time use you're putting in all of this work. So that could uh, lengthen the amount of time to maybe uh, a few weeks uh, or a couple months, depending on how, how much data you have. Great, um, another question just came in. Um, the question is, I know this might be bordering on an OCR, optical character recognition, but any ideas on how AI could be used to read transcripts, uh, grades, rigor, trends? Any thoughts on that, Emily? Can you say that one more time? Sure. Um, so uh, any idea on how AI could be used to read, uh, uh, read transcripts, grades, rigor, trends? Um, you know, I, I guess from, uh, if I can just jump in the start, um, you know, having, you know, with uh, natural language processing and, and kind of techniques that are available to us today, um, this is something that is completely, um, you know, is being done currently. Um, you know, one just uh, example would be like uh, resume parsing, right? Like taking a resume and understanding the pieces of it, comparing that to like a job posting. Um, so in terms of reading like transcripts and grades, I mean, you know, that, uh, on a very basic level is something that is currently, um, you know, available to us uh, from a technology perspective. Yeah, I, I can't say that this is um, the space I have often gone into. If we've used resumes, I'm thinking back, if we've used this information, mm, it's already been in a form. Where, uh, where we're able to uh, read it into our software program immediately. So actually that's not one that I've dealt with directly. So I apologize, I actually can't, I don't wanna comment beyond my expertise. I'm very hesitant to do that. So, so I apologize, but I can, I can certainly look some things up if you'd like and send them your way. I don't, I don't like not having an answer for you. Yeah, and that's something we can certainly visit and uh, we can um, uh, reach out to the person that uh, asked the question directly as well yeah. with some follow-up so but thanks for asking the question yeah really uh and uh that uh is was the last question that we had in the um uh, that was waiting for us so uh, okay. uh no one else has any questions uh we might be uh wrapping up here Great. yeah i think that will be uh it indeed um i want to thank you emily that was a great presentation um I mean, I put it in the chat, but I do wonder sometimes if, you know, for getting the right kinds of data that 
that could fully leverage the tool, but it seems like a really exciting one. So also want to thank uh, Student Select and Harkin for uh, developing it and for kind of sharing this uh, resource with our membership here. Uh, as a reminder, I think we brought it up in the beginning, but this session is being recorded. So if you want to reference it later on, um, or if you want to point it to other people, uh, you can use the same link that you used to join today uh, to watch the streamed version of it. Um, or you can go to ACRO's YouTube page uh, as well, or you could just simply re-register if you need to. The, uh, the webinar site will be available for at least a year and almost certainly longer than that. Uh, any concluding remarks from you, Emily or, or William? No. I just uh, appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today, and uh, we, we hope you have a great rest of the week. Yeah, thank you so awesome. much. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good one.